see we have opened up the, the webinar and the floor, um, but we will wait a few more minutes for everyone to trickle in. Uh, and then I will well, introduce myself uh, and I will set the stage and explain some, a little bit more about today's meeting, the concept and how we are planning to do things. So for now, um, yeah, sit back together with us uh, and we wait a, a few more minutes. Thank you. So I see that we already have a decent amount of people in here. So I think we can maybe just start. Um, so I will briefly introduce myself. My name is David and I will be your, uh, the host for today. <laughs> and I'll try to, to make sure everybody, sure everything runs as smoothly as possible today. So dear colleagues, um, we would like to welcome you to the first uh, AVP Plus Town Hall meeting. And um, before I, we begin, I would like to briefly explain the concept and the purpose of this meeting and also lay down some, some grand rules. So how is this different from our webinar series? Well, the town hall is really about your questions and thoughts that you have as IRO staff and, 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 and university colleagues. So it's more of a bottom up plot platform where we really actually open up the floor to discuss uh, the most pressing issues. So instead of you listening to us speak, uh, we will be listening to you today. Um, and a little bit broader context, this form is part of a, a set of actions that we're taking to ensure that uh, no end user is left behind. Um, this process is called the, the Interoperability Reinforcement Plan or the Action Plan, which you might have heard about in the last few weeks. Uh, and it's, uh, it sets out the full interoperability of IAs and LAs as the highest priority for our network. Uh, and we will be doing all sorts of different actions over the course of the next six months. Um, and this activity is part of um, a move towards uh, integrating more feedback and, and end user inputs, um, because we believe it's critical for the rollouts and uh, to continuously improve uh, the AVP network. Um, so who, who are you talking to today? Um, we have a panel of various task leaders of the AVP consortium. Um, involved with all different facets uh, of everyday activity and the management of the forum and the platform. Um, I do have to mention that questions regarding uh, my academic ID and the Erasmus app might need to be logged and passed on because not everybody could join us today. And, and if you have specific questions direct, directed at DGEAC, um, they are also not present today, so we will be passing on those questions uh, in the meantime. Also, after the session, uh, we will try to make an overview of some of the questions that were asked today uh, and make them available in Q&A form um, that we will be sharing with the national agencies that you can expect via that way. Um, and also, as always, the session is streamed on YouTube and so the recording will also be available afterwards on YouTube. Uh, some basic uh, ground rules. So how is this going to work? If you have a question, we really want to make sure this is a face-to-face -face opportunity to ask them. So, um, so we'd like to ask you if you question, raise your hand, uh, and I will be unmuting people one by one in, in order of which they appear for me. 
After you've asked your question, I, I will give some people from the consortium time to respond and we can have a little back and forth and then we move on to the next person. I do want to uh, underline that uh, we ask you to keep your tone and choice of words rather civil <laughs> uh, and that we can just have a, a nice chat with each other and just discuss uh, our ideas and our thoughts and, and, and really try to have some tangible answers and not start to scold each other or, or use um, rather strong language. And um, if somebody do, does cross a line of respect, uh, I will just try to move on to the next participants. Um, if you are, if you don't have audio and it's not possible for you to ask a question uh, live, you can always use the Q&A chats uh, to pose your questions. And at the end of the session, uh, before we close off, we will go through the Q&A and look at the, the most pressing questions there. Um, so I think without a long further announcement, um, I think we can begin. So if you have a question, I invite you to raise your hand and I can see, I will see who's first, the first one who has the honor of asking the first question. I say that, uh, I see that Rumiana, that you have been having your hand up from the beginning. I don't know if you want to ask a question, um, but I'll uh, unmute you now. So welcome, Rumiana. Or do you want to ask a question? Because I see you have your hand raised. Uh, you're muted at the moment. All right, I'll go to someone else. So Anna, uh, I see that you have your hand raised. I will unmute yourself. The floor is yours. Oh, <laughs> uh, everything moves away. So at the moment, I see some people are asking questions in the um, so there is no agenda for today. If, if I see some people asking it in the chat, there is no agenda. We create this forum for people to ask questions about their specific use case or question that they have um, to us. Um, so you don't have to look for an agenda or don't have to wait for us to ask, uh, just to tell you something. You can just ask us something. I see that Evelyn Renders, uh, you have your hand up, so I will unmute you and the floor is yours. Welcome, Evelyn. Thank you, David. I yes, hope I can hear you. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, well, thank you. First of all, thank you so much for organizing this from the EWP, EWP Plus uh, Consortium. Um, I am working at SURF, which is a national research and education network in the Netherlands. Uh, so I represent um, a lot of Dutch institutions, almost 50 uh, institutions. And we had a pre preparation meeting in which we tried to gather some of the most ask questions um, so we could deliver them in a more structured way. Um, so, and our first question is actually about the definition of mandatory business requirements. So this is one of the first points in your action uh, plan of the international, uh, no, of the interoperability reinforcement plan. Um, so we were wondering what is the status of the, this definition? And um, I think it was mentioned that there would be input um, gathered from the users. Um, so yeah, that was the first question. Right, thank you, Evelyn, for your question. Um, I think that's a question that probably best to Joao and Paul to answer, um, but maybe since uh, Paul's joining us today for the first day after his holiday, uh, I will spare him and I maybe let Joao take the word. Awesome, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for the question, Evelyn. So I think what you're trying to establish is what is this and now it's going to come into being if, uh, if I summarize it correctly. So what is this? This is essentially meant to be, if you will, a checklist um, of what is required um, to be implemented um, to decrease the room, the margin for error of interpretation of the technical specifications. This is based on our experience of the last year, year and a half where we've seen colleagues that uh, made assumptions about the completeness of um, the implementation of the EWP APIs. But um, along the way, it turns out that not all aspects of it were appropriately covered. So to make it easier for everyone operating systems to know whether they have, they support the, the necessary capability, um, this is exactly what, what's written on the can. It's a list of, um, of requirements uh, written from a business standpoint 
that uh, feed into the validation of whether tools are fit for purpose or not. And you're quite right. This is top of the list of the action plan, as uh, David put it. There was a slight delay in the approval of the action plan. We had expected to start working on it already in July, but you know, it's summer, it's not easy to, to move this kind of uh, paperwork as quickly as, as we would normally do. Um, so this work started in August and indeed goes hand in hand with the approval of the UWP governance structure, whereby there are certain bodies that uh, ought to be consulted, provided input into this plans. Um, our goal is to you know, get this done as quickly as possible, I think, and here I defer to the colleagues from Ghent. I think realistically this will have to be published in September rather than August, because even if the work starts in August, there are quite a few colleagues that understandably are on vacation, and I think we see that reflected on today's uh, volume of participation. Um, but this then feeds into other tasks of the action plan, such as the, comp the compliance testing and others, so the priority remains very high indeed. I don't know if this answers all the questions, but uh, let me know. Yes, for sure. Um, and of course, things move a bit slower in summer uh, in higher education. So that is very, very logical. Um, so that EW, yeah, I'm not sure. Am I allowed to uh, ask some kind of like a follow up question? <laughs> <laughs> or should we give the floor to someone else? Yeah, no, well, I, I think every question yeah. is understandably a little bit back and forth involved. So no problem, go ahead. Okay, yeah. So um, you mentioned it's, so this these, um, let me see. The de yeah, the mandatory business requirements, it will be written from a business standpoint. Um, could you give us an update on the different implementation differences that are now being experienced by the end users. So what we see in the Netherlands to give a little bit of background is that the end users are testing uh, the um, approval of IIAs and the sending of IIAs via the network in their production environment. And this is creating a lot of confusion because um, as they are testing it in their production environment, there's actually yeah dirty data being produced in that production environment where they are, for example, when they send out an one, um, one IAA with uh, four ISCAT codes, they might get back four IAAs, just, just to give one of the examples. Um, what is the plan to kind of, yeah, make those issues more known? Are you going to communicate about those issues to the business, to the, to the end users? Or is there some kind of, yeah, what is the, the update there? <laughs> If I can jump in, David, is that okay? So Evelyn, thank you for asking that question. That's actually a really, really, really big elephant in the room. So let's go there. Uh, it's a pleasure to get these things out of the way early. Point number one, never, ever test in a production environment. <laughs> let's make this, uh, I mean, we. it's not our job to tell everyone where they do their testing, but this is just kind of a very easy rule of thumb to follow. But where you test is also connected to who does the testing. And this is something where I think that we also can do better because ultimately end users shouldn't be involved in the testing. What we've been discussing since a very long time is asking the various operators to take responsibility for the fitness, of pur the fitness for purpose of their infrastructure. Now, we do understand that an operator might be very diligent with the testing and when users in prod are invited to, for example, start exchanging interinstitutional agreements, as the example you gave, they will still run into issues. But in principle, this should be rather minor issues rather than uh, deal breakers that, of course, then can be followed up via the respective um, via the respective support lines, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that we, in one end, need to keep reiterating this message. If I'm honest, it's also a question of efficiency. Um, it's it's so much more efficient to have um, one team, particularly a technical team, doing this kind of testing than to shift the burden to the end users, to the IROs, which always engenders a lot of frustration because <clears throat> the end user will most of the times not have the tools to figure out why a certain agreement has not uh, been circulated as, as appropriate. So I think this is really an area where we can improve a little bit. Now, on our end, we also want to move the bar considerably because the history of testing in EWP 
is an interesting one. If at any point um, my friend and colleague Anina uh, unmutes and corrects me, she's the expert on this. Let me be very clear. But let me try to just give you a, a kind of a bird's eye view of this, which is AWP originally uh, was meant to be a trust-based network in the sense that there was a lot of latitude as to how each node <clears throat> would carry out the implementations, et cetera, et cetera. Many of the third-party providers were anyway project partners going back many years. So we thought that we had a sufficient shared understanding to leave a lot of agency, which in insight, maybe not the best idea. It would have been the most cost-efficient way to deploy EWP to not put excessive burden on all the parties involved because there are many moving parts here. But particularly last year, you and other colleagues might remember that we had some issues with the timelines that were being announced. We had expected a lot of implementations, both for interinstitutional agreements and learning agreements to have been completed roughly one year ago. And we actually announced that much in, in a webinar, which is, um, I think, an insight unfortunate. What we found out was that September, October, November was when many colleagues were actually completing their implementations. Now, this is when technical testing was first introduced, and we can put a link to the wiki page that contains this. And this was um, a basic level of validation, um, whereby various parties, and particularly providers, because there's a multiplying effect to test against the reference implementation. We come to realize we need much more granular testing, um, because uh, we've found too many cases where there is a discrepancy between the testing results that we've achieved and um, the feedback that we get from the users, the tickets that are raised. So clearly something is not working. I think it's getting better, but we're not there yet. And that's also why as part of the action plan, there is a task about compliance testing, which is about the next generation of technical testing that we'll apply. Ideally, we would sit and wait for the more advanced testing to be sorted, but that's also in, neither in our interest, and I, I speak as much as I can on behalf of the community, we don't want this to take forever, nor based on the data that we have strictly necessary. We have seen important improvements over the last couple of months. So this is rather about having a deployment system that um, works as well as it can from the get-go. So these two things will happen in parallel, which is trying to move all the systems to production and make sure that they're as much as possible bug-free while at the, same test, at the same time preparing a set of validation and uh, testing um, uh, framework, if you will, that um, you know, in a few years from now, there will be new systems, whether operators or in-house systems that need to join the network, and we can be sure that um, this eventually is done without burdening the end users. It's a kind of a complicated, I don't know if my colleagues want to try to explain a bit better. Uh, this is kind of the gist of it. Yeah, I don't know if anybody else wants to interject. Um, was it uh, an answer to your question in a way, Evelyn? <laughs> yes, yes, it certainly was. It's And um, it's good that you also mentioned the compliance testing because that was actually another question of us. Uh, it was also called conformance testing in the oper interoperability plan. And it was mentioned that IBM would be involved in um, yeah, making that uh, reality. Um, the specific question that we had from our institution is how can we help? So um, they feel like with their, um, yeah, so the issues that they run into when they're testing on their sometimes production environments, sometimes they're testing on their testing environment, uh, luckily, uh, if that is provided. But of course, Erasmus dashboard users, for example, can't test on uh, a testing environment because they don't have access to that. Um, so how can they help? Like, do they send tickets to the SKE service desk? Is that, is that the way to go? Um, I, I think in short, the answer is yes, right? Um, I think the, the SKE service desk is also now with the interoperability action plan. I think we invite people who are not using the dashboards to send tickets to the to the SKE service desk so that they can collect those tickets. Um, so if there are tickets that have come along 
with a lot of specific providers, they can reach out to that provider. I mean, the, the main point for all your tickets, if you're not using a dashboard, even if you're using another dashboard, not the dashboard, uh, is also the ASCII service desk. Um, so I think the main thing for now that they can do is send indeed their data there uh, and make a mention of what they are they envision to do with it. And then we can collect it via the ASCII service desk uh, or they will relay it to the colleagues who uh, are working with the uh, third party providers. Um, I think one of the things in the action put for the people who don't know the action plan, maybe we, uh, we will link in chat uh, more information about the action plan. We also did uh, talked about it during the last webinar. That recording is also on YouTube if you want to look for more information. Uh, and on the Competence Center, there's also an article on the action plan. Um, um, so there are, there are some more information on how we will try to, to make sure that that type of information gets better collected uh, and better managed and through the, 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 the consortium and all the different uh, working groups that we have. Um, I don't know if you have other questions, Evelyn, but maybe I will, I see some other people, I will give them the, uh, the floor first and then if you can raise your hand again <laughs> to kind of get back to the end of the line, if that's possible. Of course. All right, thank you for, for being the brave soul to ask the first question. I think Joao wants to add something. Uh, it's a you. really quick note. Uh, indeed, thank you for the questions, Evelyn. Uh, just a, a footnote to what uh, David said, which is uh, there's also gonna be work done on the service desk to make it easier to channel those questions that have to do with interoperability. I think um, a lot of the feedback that we already started receiving um, as we move forward, we will uh, we have to do some work there also because we want to share those tickets with the providers so that we can track them together we're not always going to be in a position to answer them but we wanted to make sure that you know there is a follow-up happening here and so this is some of the effort that you will see already um, in the coming weeks so currently the questions that we receive of course we treat them but there will be a, a tag i believe uh, just for this kind of issues to because it's a really important feedback that um, we are very keen to engage with and again thanks for the questions evelyn and i'll see you soon i'm sure I was muted. Um, all right. I see that the next person that has raised his hand is Joey Corbin. Um, I'd like to do my best to pronounce everyone's name correctly. Normally, I would ask how to pronounce your name, but in this case, that's a little bit of a catch-22. <laughs> um, so, Joey, I'm going to allow you to speak, and the floor is yours. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, I hear you perfectly fine. All right, great, thank you. Uh, uh, thanks uh, so much for giving us the opportunity to ask questions directly. Um, I, I work at the University of Oslo uh, with digital services, and I'm also the uh, task force coordinator for EWP uh, in the Circle U uh, University Alliance. Um, my question is in regards to um, <laughs> risk management uh, and delays. Um, so how are you planning to manage the risk of delays uh, in, with new developments and components uh, being implemented in EWP, such as nominations, results, et cetera? And how do you adapt uh, your deadlines now for, for universities and end users? I mean, a testing regime and end user communication are very important, uh, and these are seem to be covered in the, uh, in the plan. Uh, but are there any strategies or internal deadlines now in place, given the history we've experienced with IIAs. Um, I think end users are, are still quite uncertain about using uh, the IIA tools almost a year after the first deadline um, because it's increased workload for some. Um, and um, the comment, it's particularly important to have the deadlines announced and adjusted ahead of time, well ahead of time. Uh, for example, the new version of Dashboard uh, um, that we were presented, I think, in the spring webinar, um, we, we, we still haven't received any details on, on the, the launch date. Uh, and I think some users are waiting for this uh, before they start really working on their IAs. Um, so major, major changes require a huge amount of preparatory work uh, at universities. So I'm, I'm hoping you could just tell us a little bit about your risk management procedures now. Thank you. All right, I think, thank you for your question, Joey. Um, I think I'll just uh, allow uh, Joao to respond first, especially regarding the, the risk. 
um, the risk part. And then I maybe I can, regarding dashboard specifically, I can open up the floor to my, our colleague Costas, um, who is uh, head of the team that's developing uh, the dashboards. So I'll, Ja, go ahead. Indeed. Uh, thanks a lot, Ja. Really good questions. Um, it's, it's, it's good to go over those issues. So you're absolutely right. It's been a bit of a roller coaster to many of us, I think all of us, and um, I think your point stands very well. So just to render the logic as explicit as I can, uh, right now the focus really is on cracking the interinstitutional agreements and the learning agreements. Um, the notion of waiting for an update to get started with that seems like a risk in and out of itself. Maybe something that we need to address as well through the communication channels, through this kind of events, um, at least in the example that that you gave. But as um, David said, I'll, I'll give the floor to Costas for more details on that. Um, now, deadlines is something that I'm not going to comment on as such, because it's obviously the colleagues from the Commission that have the last word on what's the sensible thing to do. Um, I think what we've seen in the past just judging from historic example is that there is constant monitoring of what works what doesn't and that leads to adjustments when necessary and there is one very big difference between nominations and um, the hot topics of the moment which has to do with the timeline so if i go back uh, in time the nomination the sorry the interinstitutional agreements and the learning agreements there was a huge pressure there was you know time really got collapsed because the program started a little bit late, templates were updated accordingly a little bit late, and it wasn't easy to update, for example, the APIs, which you're absolutely right, require a fair amount of preparation um, to make them available um, as quickly as possible. So that work happened in the first few months of 2021, and the expectation was that uh, within a few months more, they could have been implemented. So we have it very clear that that didn't work. And I think we already incorporated some of that in the planning of the work. So, for example, Domin Dominations APIs um, have been published, I think Yanina will help me here, but I reckon already last spring in between spring and summer. So they've been available for some time uh, from the side of the reference implementation, the dashboards, um, they will be deployed. Uh, well in advance of the deadlines to make sure that, um, you know, we are ahead of the cutoff points uh, because then we need to be able to bring the users on board to explain them how it works, what are the caveats, what are sometimes the idiosyncrasies that you find when you compare systems to one another. And obviously, constant monitoring should apply to that. You know, if that doesn't cut it, um, then the discussion is to involve the colleagues from the Commission, whether we remain on track, notably for the 23 deadlines. Um, one last remark from my side, which is, I'm really happy to talk about this and not just about interinstitutional agreements and learning agreements, because I think that is one of the challenges at the start of this academic year, notably for colleagues that do operation of systems, and those particularly that are less burdened with making their implementations of the current APIs working. Um, it is ideal, and we know that this is also uh, the reality in some cases that they start preparing for 2023. Um, and here we have um, regular meetings with all the technical community, be it operators, be it in-house systems, where we hope to have a better mechanism to figure out what kind of issues colleagues are running into. Uh, if we start hearing well in advance, uh, I'm having issue with this implementation for reason A, B, C, then we just have to get our hands dirty. Maybe in some cases we can clarify what those obstacles are about. Um, it, interestingly, this connects with the action plan as well, because there are some workshops foreseen where the main emphasis is going to be on interinstitutional agreements and learning agreements, but, you know, colleagues will be together uh, over two days in Warsaw, so there will be ample opportunity to also, in the corridor talks over coffee or dinner, to consider what other issues uh, we need to join forces about. Um, and so I think it's too early to write off the 2023 deadlines, but, you know, eyes wide open as to whether the signs suggest that uh, they remain realistic. And uh, I think if the work starts in a timely fashion, we, we have a very good chance that will remain the case. Also because um, implementations such as the transfer of records, they've changed only very slightly from what already exists since 
almost the start of EWP. So anyone that has some familiarity that has studied those specifications will presumably find it easy to deploy with a relatively low amount of effort. Nominations will take a little bit more work, but even that builds on work that started quite a few years ago. I think that's it from my side. I don't know, Costas, would you like to comment a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I don't know, maybe um, Sorry. before we go to Costas, maybe Janina, you can add something to what Joao was saying, uh, also regarding uh, like the workshops, etc. cetera. Uh, okay, so first of all, the first time we implemented uh, nominations and transcript of records was like two or three years ago. And uh, in the beginning of this year, we made some uh, updates, but uh, they are not, uh, you know, substantial ones. So uh, the specifications are there. Already these specifications are stable and the, your providers can start implementing. So uh, really, uh, and the, what is important is that already there are some test environments when you can test uh, both nominations and transcript of records. Uh, whoever is ready and would like to start testing, uh, contact me and I will be happy to, uh, to take part in this testing. Uh, yes, uh, we have uh, uh, also as a part of uh, action plan, we uh, scheduled two uh, workshops for providers. Both will take place in September in Warsaw. Uh, the first one will be in the 6th and 7th of September, the second one 20 and 21st. We still have uh, three places. So if uh, your provider has not yet uh, registered for this event, please make him to do that because we have as i said we organize it we we have a very nice agenda we want to talk especially about learning agreements institutional agreements do some online uh, some face-to-face -face testing and also talk about the future meaning uh, what else we might need to have in those two topics, meaning interinstitutional agreements and learning agreements. Very important events for providers and uh, uh, just present your provider to this event. All right, thank you, Janina. So yeah, as Janina mentioned, this is something that we are working on. This is something that we have reached out to, to all providers. So um, yeah, if you want to go ahead and send them an email uh, as a reminder, <laughs> like check your inbox, EVP is calling you. Um, yeah, go ahead and do that. Uh, so thank you, Janina. And then maybe Kostas, I'll give the floor to you to respond to the question regarding the dashboards uh, and like the roadmap regarding uh, updates coming up. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, Joey. Uh, jo Joao and Janina covered, it, covered the, the, the question nicely, but... Uh, let me just uh, also give you my two cents on the issue of the, of the timeline. Um, the improved UI UX and the full release of everything we've shown in the, in the previous uh, webinar is uh, scheduled for late uh, 2022. Now, behind the scenes, there is already uh, ongoing development work in various components of the of the infrastructure but but the timeline for the improved ui ux we've presented uh, is scheduled for late 2022 now going back to the question to, to joy's question whether someone should wait i think zoa already said it but i'm gonna repeat it also no <laughs> the, the they shouldn't wait the exchange of the interinstitutional agreements and the learning agreements, the functionality is there in the EWP dashboard and the improved UI UX shouldn't be an excuse not to use the tool now. All right. Thank you, Costa. Thanks. Um, yeah, Joy, so... Joy, Joy, I hope I, Joy, I hope I have answered your question. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. It's uh, very, very reassuring. Um, um, I can't speak to uh, my coordinators uh, and the alliance or uh, or at my university because it's really it's really up to them and they're the ones who are using it uh, in reality uh, uh, at the moment. So if they decide to wait, then uh, then there are good reasons for that. But uh, but thank you, Constantinos, Janina, and you all uh, for your uh, answers. Uh, it's very reassuring, and I am sure you're uh, you're sick to death of repeating things. But I think a lot of us need to have it two or three times before we really 
trust and understand it. So um, looking forward to seeing this uh, new machinery in action. Thank you. Uh, no, thank you, Joey, for being here and asking the question. Uh, and just to add on to what Kostos was saying, um, I know that end of 2022 is not like the most sexy deadline. I mean, we probably re would prefer to have an exact date uh, and then that's all it's going to be there at that time. Um, but it's something that needs to be tested and make sure that works. So, um, yeah, I think it's something that we're all looking forward to. Uh, and it, it, the end of 2022, beginning of 2023 is not that far away anymore. So, and in terms of communication, I think maybe we should, uh, we can do, make sure again, like send out a message regarding a dashboard and what's going to happen. And that it doesn't mean that you should be waiting. <laughs> Normally everything should work uh, and the things that, are keeping you from doing it now isn't going to, I mean, it's, it will look nicer and some things will be easier, um, but it, it, it should work now and it's not not going to change uh, just because of the, the updates and the new version that's coming out. Um, but I see some other people have their hands in the air. Uh, the next person is Isabel Bekema, I think. Um, I hope that pronounced it correctly. So Isabel, I'm going to uh, unmute, unmute you and the floor is yours, go ahead. Thank you. I hope I'm audible. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, good. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm uh, working at Humboldt University in Berlin. Um, we use Move On for our EWP uh, processes. And just to give a number, I've been working on IIAs for a year now, and I have correctly finalized 9%. So <laughs> I'm quite... <laughs> I'm quite... Uh, scared about how this is going on. I wanted to ask specifically that that's why I wanted to specifically ask about third party providers. Um, is there any way to get them to sit together? Like if I if I send a, an issue to my provider, I usually get the answer, well, we made it the way it's supposed to be made. So the issue isn't with us and then I'm stuck in waiting for things is 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 your plan going to make any changes to that issue um so thank you for your question um i will I, i'm looking at who can respond to that i think maybe it's joao again <laughs> um but i just so that you know um there is ways that we are communicating with third party providers and communicating with each other so um this is something that uh, the cost team is facilitating. Um, so I think maybe Joao, you can explain a little bit more how, how we're doing it and in what way we are engaging with third party providers. This was something that's already going on before the action plan. So this is not something that is just starting with the action plan, but um, if you would go, if, like we have a link in the chat, if you want to go over the action plan at a later time, there are some ways that we are increasing that collaboration and making it more coherently. Um, so, Joao, um, maybe you can add something to that. Thanks, David, and thank you for the question, Isabella. So, the truth is that I don't think there's a single action that can solve the problem that you described. So, we're gonna have, it's going to have to rely on a combination of actions. Essentially, the approach that we've taken in the action plan is to try to triangulate these problems a little bit. And our starting point was the webinar we did, I think it was in April, the first one, where one of the things that stayed with the team was colleagues saying, well, I have an issue, but then what ensues is basically a finger pointing. The issue lives somewhere else or I can't do anything about it. So the, the point is that this needs to be a win-win. We, we can't do this without the providers. Um, a large part of the action plan is to actually intensify the cooperation with them. And it's going to be a combination of actions. So the first, I'll piggyback on what we were just commenting, which is, if um, the problem that you describe, I suspect it's related with interoperability uh, to a large extent. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing is that we have to make the, inv the invisible visible to us and hence the notion of opening up the service desk to take on these tickets. Um, we will be in one end sharing them, but also reading them and trying to understand what are their patterns, whether there's something that emerges that um, informs a possible problem and a solution. We do have an action on the action plan, which is exactly about proactive debugging. So the more transparent we can make errors in communication, assuming that this is what's keeping approval rates at 9% in your 
Okay, uh, we need to figure out what explains for this. Is, is it that every time that you send an error to a given partner using a given system, <clears throat> things get lost in the vacuum of the internet? Um, if so, we can log this and we can get the engineers to look into it and to try to devise solutions because in some cases we have the feeling that errors are not handled very transparently in AWP towers, the end users. So um, in some cases we might be able to make progress on our own based on what we see in our various interactions. In others, we might draw inspiration from someone reporting what exactly seems to happen when they run into, into a system. And then there's yet another step, which has to do with uh, error logging at the technical level, whereby this needs to become automatized. I mean, basically someday I would like to be able to sit in some control room with a big screen in front and be able to see in real time what kind of errors, communication errors are popping up in the OP. It, we might not be there yet um, because right now uh, we, we've had, and I think it was at the last meeting we've had uh, of the technical community, it's called the Infrastructure Forum. Um, there was a comment from a colleague operating a system that I think is used by around a dozen universities, whereby he was started transferring tickets about agreements that were not completed. But what was interesting was that what was keeping them from being completed was not a technical problem. It was just a lack of action from the side of the partners. Um, we objectively don't know what's the mix here. I, I imagine that there are a few colleagues that got frustrated along the way over the last couple of months and might be looking, as um, the previous colleague said, for a signal to get back to their um, dashboards and whatnot and to process those agreements. So we basically, we have to get our hands much dirtier, go much deeper into this. We know that time is very limited, but um, we're throwing the kitchen sink at it. We, we literally want to, um, yeah, to, to see how far we can push this. And again, I think we've also seen some positive signs in the next couple of weeks and even one, two months, maybe three months even, when some really big errors have been addressed by uh, the relevant technical teams. And I'm not naming, I'm not speaking about your provider in particular, as you as you might understand. Um, so if it is a frustrating exercise, and uh, you know, you're assigned for persisting and getting those agreements uh, pushed out of the door. And we basically need to have your back. So I, my colleagues might elaborate a little bit. I think these are the main tools that we try to equip ourselves to make sense of what is what is keeping us from getting much closer to 100% of the agreements and to when it's a technical issue to do what needs to be done in that front. Thank you, Joao. So there are two things, uh, Isabel, that I want to add on that Joao was saying. The first is that you mentioned the infrastructure forum. So if you don't know what it is, it's a group where AVP meets with all the providers, with representatives from all the providers to talk, to talk about all the technical implication, uh, implementation, everything going on. So that's a group that meets on a regular basis where we discuss um, um, all, the all the ongoing uh, activities and things that needs to be do done uh, with providers and in-house systems. So that already exists and that's part of, 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 of uh, our structure. And the other thing is that during the last webinar, um, we announced uh, the introduction of user-specific uh, groups. Um, so that's it's via Slack, it's a communication website, and where we have groups, um, different communication groups uh, for all the different uh, system users. Um, so we have for dashboard users, we have for in-house, or you can also make a group for the there's a group for the larger specific uh, providers. So I assume there there's a group of move on users there where you can talk to your other user movers, where you can see like, if you have, for example, a common issue, you can discuss it with each other. And if you see everyone is this, having this issue, I would recommend you can uh, submit a ticket to the ASCII service desk so that our colleagues are also become aware of this issue. Um, so there are different ways where you can notify us when there is an issue with your provider um, or where you can, I think joining the Slack group is already uh, maybe a good idea if you're not, do, not done that yet, because then you can find some like-minded colleagues who might share the same frustration, frustration about your provider or who have been able to figure out solutions to the problem that you're having. Um, so those are the two specific things that I wanted to add. I don't know if this answers your question in a way. I, I see Paul raising his hand. Um, Paul, do you want to add something? 
Maybe also that uh, in the context of the action plan, uh, there will be um, relationship managers recruited. So uh, also the working relationships between the consortium and those specific service providers uh, will, will be um, will benefit from from such uh, such intermediate uh, role. And of course, they will also uh, monitor the user groups. So that's also a small addition to what has been said already. All right, thank you, Paul. So I hope that answers your question anyway, Isabel. Uh, yes, thank you. I, I'm, do you have a link to the Slack groups? Because I don't think I got the message that that's there. So I'd love to join. <laughs> yes, um, I and... think we will share a, a link to the news article where's all the information on how it works and how you can join. Ah, uh, great, that's thank you. Right yeah, then that's me for now. All right, thank you for joining. Um, I see the next person who has raised his hand is uh, Beren Klopstra. Uh, Beren, welcome. Um, and I will allow you to speak. So the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, David. Um, I have a question concerning the uh, ASE, European Student Identifier. Um, we had a bit of a panic at our uh, institution, Windersheim and Zwolle. Uh, where they uh, got from the student information system also a field called uh, ASE. And they were, uh, were wondering, okay, what are we supposed to do with this? Um, um, and that sort of, sort of got the ball rolling for us. Okay, what, what else are we going to use it for? Uh, because I know it's, it, it, it's part of the EWP and uh, it's a unique identifier, but uh, there was also the question, okay, do we have to implement this in our you know normal student information system not our mobility system but does it have to be all the way into the uh, the uh, it uh, environments does it has to be used over there and i we also have uh, encountered uh, uh, that there is a you know, quite a misunderstanding about are we going to use one number is it just a number we generate per mobility or is a student getting that same number even if they go on six different mobilities. Some people say they keep the same one. Other people say, no, every mobility is a new number. Um, that makes, the, and, and we also wonder, okay, how is it checked? You know, one, when will an EC expire? What if a student doesn't pay his bills, his tuition? Uh, how do we uh, give it to uh, EWP? From, okay, you know, the, the EC is not valid anymore. Um, so we have a lot of questions uh, we, we can really find an answer to. Uh, and also, uh, uh, is the ESE uh, planned to be used for more things than just EWP? Uh, or is it going to be a general European student identifier? Uh, and how does that relate to the uh, uh, European uh, digital identity that's also being discussed for every EU citizen? Aren't we doing things double? So we have a lot of questions <laughs> and it's uh, really hard to get a, a simple answer. We also uh, contacted uh, our sp uh, spokesperson who also said, yeah, okay, we also, you know, we don't really know what, uh, wh where the, where the uh, ownership is uh, and uh, the big plans of ASE is. So we, uh, besides mobility, we don't really know what to do with, with ESI. So that's uh, fired a lot of questions, but I hope you can uh, give some answers. Um, yeah, well, I can see based on the nodding of my colleagues that we do have some answers for you. Um, so maybe uh, I don't know who wants to take this one first. Um, Joao, go ahead. Cool. Hey, Baron, thanks a lot for the questions. Um, let me try to do a, a quick round and uh, chances are I'm not going to hit the nail on the edge for everything you have in mind, but at least we can cover more ground a little bit more quickly. So um, where does the SI live? Um, what we stipulated is where it comes from. It's issued by the university. So whether you wanted to make it live in your student information system or elsewhere, you have some latitude there. That's why you might not find a, an answer to this one. Most universities that we know of deploy this at the level of the SIS, just because it's one deployment. In one go, you basically cover all the potential users. And the question of whether the student number changes when you have a different ability, this is actually addressed at the specifications because there are two formats of VSI. I didn't got where you're coming from. So in some countries, uh, there's a national student identifier and there's the possibility to issue an ESI using this kind of EduID uh, solution. And the majority, this is going to be connected to the local identifier that university uses. And this starts answering um, the third question, which is, 
in which conditions does the site get deprecated? If your institution um, is going to use the version that has the local number uh, in terms of its semantics, indeed, when the student is no longer a student, that goes out of the system. Bear in mind that we don't, well, <laughs> I have to say this with a grain of salt in my, in my Colleagues will help me here. I was going to say we don't store ESIs in the sense that when we use ESI, for example, um, to authenticate a student in a service, of course, that that is used as the main identifier for mobility. That's indeed the main use case, and this is reflected in the latest versions of the EWP APIs. But in, what I meant is that the student will not have uh, rights in, if they need to re-authenticate and this identifier is no longer there if their permissions essentially are no longer there, which is kind of the beauty of federated authentication. Now, is it going to be used for something else? Um, we reckon yes. I mean, the main use case right now is to have it as the main identifier of students to mobility. Um, but we're getting a lot of interest, uh, questions, ideas, and discussions with colleagues, for example, from European universities. And now this can be leveraged for things like facilitating access to a joint LMS or that kind of stuff. So I don't want to get too technical, and I don't want to overpromise as well, but uh, we think this this actually has a good future out of, of it, um, at least based on the current understanding. With regards to um, European Union identification of citizens, uh, that's a really good question. So let me try to answer that at two levels. Uh, the current EIDAS, love it or hate it, and I don't know where you stand on that, um, this is something that was bootstrapped as part of the My, Acad My Academic ID project. So one of the things that we're working on is to have um, a easy to use account linking possibility, which should allow the two to kind of uh, correlate to some extent, which is not a must for most use cases that we have here, like learning agreements and stuff. But for example, if down the road you want to use this kind of infrastructure for things like rent agreements or rental contracts, um, this would come in handy. So we already monitoring, no, we already implemented um, some kind of dialogue. Of course, CIDA has one problem, which is not all uh, program countries, let alone, uh, and certainly not all member states have already put this into production. We are also tracking what's the discussion with regards to um, the revision of, of this framework. And we have every intention to keep this future proof as much as possible. And there are already some ideas floating how this can talk with future wallets and that kind of stuff. So in a nutshell, uh, that's it from my side, but I apologize in advance if I only answer part of the questions and um, please let us know whether um, how we can help further. If yeah, I, I don't know. If I may jump yeah. in. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to stress that uh, ESI is the student unique identifier, which means that uh, there should not be the case where two students have the same. However, it may be the case when one student has more than one, because it will still allow us to identify the student uniquely. Also, I wouldn't uh, look at the status of the student as something strictly connected with the ESI, because this is kind of an uh, orthogonal attribute of a student. So the student, for example, in our university, the student will get his ESI, he will not be the active student for a while. If he comes back to the university after three years, he will have the same ESI. So if you will be asking about the ESI of the student, you will get it despite his uh, uh, status. However, if you will ask about the status of the students, depending on time, you will get the information active, not active. But this is something uh, kind of different. And ESI are really very, very important, especially when we will start talking about nominations and we will want to uh, map uh, those uh, uh, learning agreements with those nominations, with this transcript of records. We have to make sure in our system, in an automatic way, uh, uh, that uh, all these uh, different documents are connected to the same person. And uh, well, I, I just, one more uh, thought, uh, citizen is, uh, not every citizen is a student. So we need some a different identifier for citizens and not uh, than the one for the students. So that's my opinion. Thank you. Yeah, so I think if, 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 if I'm correct in a brief summary, like the unique student identifier is just a unique number that will allow us to, given that we have to work with many different countries, many different situations, um, it, it will be the one thing that is unique about a student. Um, 
that will allow us to connect all these different systems with each other. So um, it's something that will be very relevant in the future and make the work of a lot of people <laughs> much easier uh, and also moving forward. Um, and I think if I'm correct, Beren, that you're from the University of Zwolle. Yeah, that's um, correct. Yeah, answer that's correct. Yeah. All then, right. That's in the Netherlands. Yes. Um, so I, I hope that answers your questions in a way. I think it, given the fact that there were so many confusion about it uh, on your side and that the people you spoke to, maybe it is something that we should look into from the con communication standpoint that when we have all the information that it becomes clear what, um, what the roadmap is for ESI, we can also communicate it on it more um, wholesomely. <laughs> um, yeah. Sort of uh, what is it and uh, what can you expect uh, or review? It's especially uh, would be very useful uh, because uh, if you, at least that that's a, that's our case. If you look at the internationalization uh, part of our university, okay, we have like uh, twenty eight thousand students, but only like eight hundred go abroad. So uh, in the you know bigger sense, of what the university is uh, 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 looking at internationalization isn't really a big part of it. And if you have IT sensitive or difficult stuff. We do not have, you know, big software architects looking over uh, the shoulder with the international office all the time uh, uh, to help them figure out all the uh, uh, IT uh, uh, details that are being uh, well, addressed. So um, it's, it's pretty hard to get it on the radar. Um, and it's pretty hard to get these people invested because if I try to send them to the wikis, that's uh, about the Erasmus. It's really well confusing, and you know <laughs> they basically end up st they stop reading after like you know ten minutes because okay, well pff, they don't know where to find their ex their the questions that uh, of the answers for the questions they actually have. So it's uh, it would be really helpful if you have a, a, a focused communication about the an ESI and all the things it can and cannot do. Um, I think I, 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 there's a two-part answer here. First, I will re ask response uh, on the, the communication and the wiki. And second, I think our, my colleague Janina will respond to the different platforms that we have for developers to go through. Um, first, Thank on you. the communication, um, we, will, we are working on making a, a more clearer overview of everything, uh, all the information that we have. Um, the, comp the competence center, um, we have been done doing some focus group uh, where we ask people questions, how they experience communication via the competence center. Uh, and as part of, of, of uh, our activities, I think um, one thing that we can say is that we will move the information to a, uh, to a central platform that we will be communicating also later where all the information uh, available for university and IROs and all the different uh, links for uh, here can you go as developer, here can you go as a student, etc. That will also become much more clearer. Um, but uh, as my colleague Janina will mention, there are different platforms that we have specifically for IT personnel and developers um, where we have all the information and where they can also ask questions to uh, the developing people from the consortium. Yeah, I fully agree. And uh, in my opinion, ESI, implementing ESI on a uh, SIS uh, level is really the, the easiest way, <laughs> the easiest task we had in our uh, whole mobility uh, development. So please send your IT guys to us and we will be happy to explain what is going on, what they should do to implement. Um, and as I mentioned in the beginning, for the people who may be later after the session, we will have a, a short Q&A document where we have some of the questions that were asked today with some of the answers that we gave. And I, I think in there I can, I can put the links to the developer page um, uh, where, where, where you can send your IT colleagues where, with all their questions. Because I, I know from, from my side that when the IT staff have a question for me, it's also, it's, it's also like they speak a different language. So. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to put in the links there as well. Um, so I hope that answered your question, Berend. Um, I will awesome. try to, to make available necessary information. And if, if it ends up uh, not being uh, sufficiently enough, you can always uh, reach out to us again. That's very helpful, uh, David. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. No problem. Thank you for being here. Um, so uh, I see a few more hands. The next person in, in line is... is, is um, Anna Dara Fea. Anna Dara Fea. Uh, I hope that's correct. Uh, Anna, um, I'm going to allow you to speak, and the floor is yours. Welcome. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you loud and clear. Yeah, cool. Uh, first of all, you did a really great job on my surname, better than most people do. 
Um, uh, and thank you. thank you for the opportunity to um, ask questions. Um, I'm a real newbie when it comes to Erasmus Plus in general, as I've only recently started working in the international office. Um, so my main question for today is, um, we come from a very small college and we mainly do training um, abilities. And in one of the previous EWP seminars, I think I've heard that um, online learning agreements are available only for study mobilities. Is that so? And if yes, what do we do then? All right. Um, thank you for being a newbie and, and already have watched one of the webinars. I think uh, it's good. I think we, we, you are in a situation similar to a lot of people that we hear. Uh, we do have a lot of new people joining, coming in and out. Um, so I think there is a lot of information available for your questions. Um, regarding this specific question, I think, Joao, you can take this one. Yeah, um, I know. Warm welcome to the PWP family, and you're absolutely right. So this has been thought of as a step-by-step -step process. We started with study mobilities um, in the classic sense because that's where the bulk of our workload is, and eventually we will have to proceed and vanquish as well the question of placements and internships, but they're not in scope of the current deadlines. Um, the idea is that we build on our successes because there will be a few to report, not just problems, so that then that we can address that as quickly as possible. So it's forthcoming. I think it's brilliant that you're as much as possible keeping an eye on those discussions because this will equip you to um, you know, very quickly then understand what's going on, what's going to be announced. Um, but that's, that's kind of for the future. Um, although it's obviously something we'd be excited to work on because the number of placements and traineeships is only increasing, so uh, can't come soon enough. Okay, thank you for that. I will just uh, really quickly double check then. So am I understanding correctly that with the uh, training mobilities, the only thing that we're able to do digitally at the moment is inter-institutional agreements, and then uh, OLA and uh, student identifiers will come a bit later? Um, yes, I think that's correct. Um, I don't know. Yes, I would add our, well, student identifiers should be generated in your student information system as soon as possible, because even if they are not needed for learning agreement, they are needed for nominations. So please start thinking uh, about it or working with that as soon as possible. That's my advice. And as for the inter-institutional agreements, um, the bulk of the agreements that is now being signed online is for student mobility for studies. Uh, as you know, for traineeships, um, the agreement is not a mandatory requirement from the program, but some uh, higher education institutions indeed uh, prefer to have those uh, agreements signed as well. And it's indeed possible to, uh, to sign the traineeship um, cooperation conditions uh, under this, uh, this framework. So that's correct. Thank you very much. I think that answers all of my current burning questions. All right. Well, no, it was nice to see you here today. And like I said, if you have any other questions, uh, I think the Competence Center is a place to start. But uh, given that it's also uh, a lot of information on there. If you have any other questions, uh, you can always go to uh, the, the Slack groups that we mentioned. Like there, I think there is also different groups where you can ask questions. Um, and we are also, like I say, we are we are also on Slack sometimes. So um, you can always find us uh, as well. And you can also use the the ASCII service desk for for more basic questions or information or or even ideas. So. Um, I hope that you will find your way in the in the EVP universe because it's a it's a big universe. <laughs> All right, um, I see there are two two more hands. Um, we will do those, um, and then we will also look briefly at some of the Q and A questions. Um, like I said, we, we we probably won't be able to answer all questions that are in the Q and A. Um, but uh, I think a lot of the information that, or the questions that are being asked there is also a lot of different information available uh, on all the different topics on our information website. 
So um, I see Evelyn is, is back on top of the line. So Evelyn, welcome back. Thank you, David. Um, I heard Joao paint a really nice picture about leaning back and seeing all the real-time errors uh, popping up on his screen in the future. Um, and I think that he might be referring to the statistics API that is being developed. Um, there was a specific concern in the Netherlands uh, from Radboud University because um, this new API, the statistics API, is asking for development time and development resources uh, of the third party provider. And um, that actually goes um, at the cost of developing the APIs that are already there, like uh, learning agreements, IIAs, and implementing them, them in the right way. And then, of course, all, also the nominations and everything that is going to come. So what is the priority? What is the obligation of implementing this statistics API? And is it also possible to, for the first time, like get more manual updates about uh, the statistics? Um, and that also correlates a little bit to the communication to the end users. So could you perhaps post like updates about specific errors um, to perhaps a Slack group or any kind of other yeah, communication platform that you uh, use for us? Thank you. All right, well, I'll answer the communication side. Uh, I'll wait and see which of my colleagues wants to respond on the communication side. Um, I think it's something that we consider um, specifically, for example, if it's dash dashboard related, because dashboard is something that, that we have more control over. And th there are a lot of issues that are being fixed uh, by on dashboard on a daily basis. So I think it might be possible to give uh, occasionally a brief overview of what has been done. Um, but uh, as mentioned, we are not, we are not, it's not, we do, I don't think it's possible for us to provide updates on everything that goes on uh, in the, in behind the scenes of all the different providers, uh, because we don't, we, <laughs> I think in most cases, we don't know what's going on behind the scenes, I think. Um, so, but I think it's a good idea, uh, something to think about from a communication standpoint that if major updates happen or if something that being reported uh, gets fixed, it's something that we can, can, can mention. Um, regarding your other questions, um, I think it's Joao or Janina um, who can answer that. I think Janina, go ahead. Yeah, okay, Evelyn, if you are taking part in the infrastructure forum meeting, so you know that we have been talking about statistics for since three months or, or longer already. And in the very beginning, we first of all, we worked on specification, what might be of use. Then we ask the providers to get this data by hand. So uh, just write a simple SQL and uh, get the data from the database and send it by hand. And uh, as you may also know, the timeline is the following. So for the second time, the providers are asked to send the data by hand. Uh, and uh, well, honestly, in, in the case of our system, to write those uh, SQLs, wouldn't take longer than half a day or a day. So this is not comparable with the other uh, tasks we have with the interinstitutional agreements or learning agreements. Yes, this is extra effort, that, but this effort, effort is, uh, well, comparably small, I would say. Uh, eventually, uh, the providers will be asked to uh, automatize this process because we have been asked by the commission and the commission has been asked by the national agency and national agency are, well, the, the other option is that the national agencies will ask higher education institutions each, each by each. And it is much better, better to do it globally, not to, you know, per uh, higher education institution. So uh, in my opinion, implementing these uh, three extra endpoints of the, of the three APIs should not be such an issue should not stop the other important work. Uh, of course, learning agreements, any issues with learning agreements and the uh, interinstitutional uh, agreements have the highest priority. However, we do need these statistics to be able to show what is going on in the, uh, in the network and the, where the problems are. Because uh, some of you say 9% of interinstitutional agreements. And then we get the statistic from the other partner and we see 60%. So where is the problem? Looking at this 
data, we will be able to find out the problem and uh, firefight it. So uh, one of the uh, uh, extra tasks we put on the providers are these extra endpoints for gathering statistics. The other ones we want to start discussing and we will also put on the providers would be to track errors in the network. The providers will be asked to deliver uh, um, uh, error messages they got from their partner to the central uh, uh, server where these uh, uh, messages will be, uh, you know, browsed, handled, and again, give us some uh, overall picture of the network in operation. This, as I said, looks like a much smaller uh, activity than uh, implementing the main business uh, uh, processes of the Erasmus Plus program. I do hope so. But let's be in touch. Uh, let's uh, visit, uh, in, uh, take part in infrastructure forums, uh, come to the uh, workshop, because these are the places where we discuss all these issues with the providers. And here you can get the uh, the technical information and the, uh, some help. All right, thank, thank you, you Nina. I think Kostas also wants to interject. Yes, I just wanted to say that um, uh, basically all the providers, which all the providers and the WP dashboard and the in-house solutions, we should push for this exchange of statistics to happen automatically. Uh, Manually exchanging statistics is more effort than <laughs> actually making the endpoints. I mean, <laughs> yeah. maybe thank I'm you. stating maybe I'm stating the obvious, but uh... yeah, thank you, Costas. I forgot about this. This <laughs> the best <laughs> argument. <laughs> I, 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 I hate I hate it when they make me exchange manually statistics. I mean, <laughs> let's specify the endpoints and. This should happen automatically. So I think the, the short version of the answer, uh, Evelyn, is that I think we are as much as an asking party as you <laughs> to have access to as much statistic as possible about the states of the network. Um, I, I don't know, Joao, if you want to add something or we can go on to the next question. All right, um, Evelyn, I hope that answered your question. Uh, I see Isabel, you also have a, an additional question. And then I see Joey as well. I think after that, we will have to uh, round up um, a little bit uh, and then we see if you maybe have some short time for the Q&A questions but in general for everyone who posts a question in Q&A which wasn't answered um, we in the, Q in the final document we will provide all the different links to the, the service desk and all the other places where you can find information or ask a question as well and um, so Isabel I'm going to uh, unmute you so you can uh, take the floor again. Yes, thank you. Here I am again. <laughs> um, just wanted to quickly say the issue I'm having right now is move on and dashboard. And my question is related to that. If I were to swap back from move on to dashboard for IIAs, would I lose the progress I've made already? Or does that swap with it? Um... I think, sadly, the answer would be yes, you would lose <laughs> uh, the progress made, um, but I'm not sure. So I don't, I don't know, uh, maybe Kostas, given that you're the dashboard expert. Yes, hi, Isabel. Hi. I, I, th I think you're referring to the data portability matter, right? And um, this is not supported yet. You, you are talking about switching providers, right? Yes. Yes. I don't know if Joao can add uh, some words on this. Uh, um, only words of comfort. So this has been a big discussion for a while now that we've also been looking for to sink our teeth in. But currently, there is nothing that has been tested to be very transparent that would allow you to change the providers and taking the data with you in a manual way. Um, it's a recurrent question. Uh, you're not alone in, in, in raising it, Isabel. And I think it's something that need, will eventually be added to the, the plan of activities as soon as possible. I, I think I speak on behalf of the team when we say that, you know, <laughs> we're looking forward to, to look into this. 
Um, we think it should do a world of good uh, also for the running of the network in normal circumstances, make it make things a little bit easier for IROs to you know stress the agency that universities have. Um, there are some ideas. Costas actually has started working on how this could be implemented, but we're not at a point where we could confidently tell you push this button and everything is going to migrate smoothly. So um, some of these ideas will have to be developed further, tested um, before we can make this available to anyone across the WP network. But so whilst this is not probably what you hoped to hear, uh, I do appreciate that you put this on the agenda because it's good that um, we keep that matter in mind. Yeah, the work will have to be done on both sides. So this is not only the question on the network side. Yes, the, the, this is correct. This is a global issue. I mean, yeah. data portability should be transparent in every node in the network. Yeah, exactly. Every node would have to add this uh, export-import uh, functionality. Again, mm -hmm. extra mm -hmm. burden on, on providers. Um, and to sum up what my colleague said, um, this is not something that's on the immediate horizon. So for people who are dealing with issues now or working on it, um, similar to what we were saying before, please don't wait <laughs> until this becomes available to switch to, 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 to do the what you need, what needs to be done. Um, as well as not wait for using the dashboard on future updates. Um, like I said, it's something that we all hope that can be part of, of the AAP network. Um, it should be part of the AAP network, but it's not for the immediate uh, future. So sorry, Isabella, that's not the answer that you were you were hoping for. Well, it's it's uh, yeah. Well, I'm glad that it's at least in uh, on on the on the table. Like it's it's in the minds of people and being thought about and at some point it will be there i guess yes we hope we hope we are hoping to gather with you and so Thank you. then um joey you have the the honor of being the last person uh, to to ask a question during the first town hall meeting um so go ahead welcome back hey thank you uh <laughs> um yeah my question is in regards in regards to alliances um uh, how will you focus on alliance needs in the future? Are there any big plans uh, 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 that we don't yet know about? Um, some alliances are creating their own um, kind of IT solutions and infrastructures for data sharing and other technical needs. Uh, but the alliances are really largely rooted in Erasmus+. Plus. Would it make more sense that EWP and yeah, the Erasmus app and the other um, uh, solutions here be used as as the you know technical infrastructure instead of each alliance using considerable resources to create their own solution. Um, our alliance, uh, for example, um, we have our own solution for um, course data um, on available alliance opportunities. We're talking about uh, uh, an LMS uh, or connections between LMSs and their own integrations here and. Um, uh, and other uh, SAAS uh, solutions. Um, yeah, using EWP for, mul for multilateral IIAs um, would be an example of uh, uh, some need this uh, for BIP and alliance um, uh, uses and allowing us to use EWP with multiple different tools for incoming and outgoing mobility. For example, an in-house solution for outgoing mobility and a third party provider for incoming mobility. That would also help. Um, and it has been suggested before. Um, uh, and I believe this could help solve some alliance issues as well. So I'm uh, looking forward to hearing your response. Um, all right, I think I can take the first part of the question um, before I move to my colleagues. Um, Within the governance structure uh, of the AAP consortium, like I mentioned, we have the infrastructure forum and there are I think this will also be communicated in the near future, but part of this envisioned structure or how we want to run this whole gang uh, is that there will be a university network forum uh, specifically for bringing representatives of university network and associations as well as student organizations. So there will be uh, a place within the governance structure where we will consult and allow space for university networks to be consulted because as you say, they are a big part of the uh, higher education community. Um, 
And then specifically the thing that you mentioned can be discussed. Um, but on the other part of the question, um, I think maybe, Joao, you can also round up our meeting today. Um, actually, no, I'm going to need Janina's up. Um, so, Joe, the question you've put about inbound and outbound systems. Um, indeed, that has been raised. Um, and I don't know if that is strictly forbidden the current implementation. Uh, Janina, would you able to... I would rather say that, uh, especially when you mentioned these uh, business processes you would like to cover, it kind of orthogonal to what we need for the uh, main business processes, processes of EWPs. So we are now concentrating on interinstitutional agreements, learning agreements, transcript of records, nominations, not on courses, but courses may come later on. For uh, alliances, they might be a priority for the time being. However, I don't see, for example, how uh, why uh, alliances cannot exchange uh, transcript of records to share uh, student grades and the information about courses students uh, ha have been registered to. So in my opinion, uh, what uh, Erasmus plus uh, what IDA European network has to offer can be of use for alliances. Maybe this is not enough and more will come uh, in time. However, start using the EWP network for uh, exchanging the data among alliances. Uh, nominations, why not? Uh, transcript of records, why not? Courses are not our priority right now because our priority are uh, this more, most, uh, most uh, uh, the main uh, business processes of uh, of the mobility of the Erasmus Plus mobility, but that will come. Also, multi as I remember, multi multilateral agreement, interinstitutional agreements are on our radar, but because they are delayed delayed a little bit because of the problems we are uh, facing with the regular interinstitutional agreements. So they should have been addressed by us, as I remember, the end of this year, but uh, we had to postpone this because of other issues more important for the time being. Uh, but, uh, well, uh, I would say alliances are uh, among our most important clients because a, a, a lot of mobilities are, is going on between uh, higher education institutions inside alliances and alliances are there they will survive. We have a second round of uh, um, agreements being signed there. So they are on our radar, definitely. Thank you. Um, well, I, I, I understand this, that about the, the business processes and I appreciate you reminding uh, us of that. Um, the Just the way I see it is, is that um, and alliance needs are, are different than traditional uh, mobility opportunities. I mean, um, the application or what, whatever you want to call it, admission enrollment application process is, uh, is often different than what it is for, uh, uh, for other more traditional mobility types. Um, the way course data is gathered and presented, uh, um, uh, and, and transferred is also different than traditional mobility uh, um, opportunities. And then you have these other needs such as like, oh, are we going to have a, a common uh, LMS? Are we, what do we need uh, um, that is like shared between the universities? So um, you're kind of, uh, the, way, the way our alliance is kind of working is just like, yeah, we can, we can you know, get the student registered in our SIS, and then we can connect them through EWP so we can exchange the results. But all these other needs, you know, application, LMS, uh, um, uh, yeah, there, there are many other things here, but it's just, um, it's difficult because we're just seeing it, uh, thinking we have to create all these solutions by ourselves. Um, so it's a little disappointing and I hope really that Alliance needs will be um, prioritized in the future. All right, thank you for, for your, your feedback, Joey. Um, I, I, I'm very bad at closure, and I see that one person raised their hand. So maybe Laurence, as a, as a final, final question, um, I, can, I can give you the floor, welcome. Okay, hello. Hello, I can hear you. 
Okay, thank you. I, I'm calling from Belgium and we work with only with Erasmus dashboard, okay? And I created organizational units to work and each organizational unit corresponds to one faculty, one department uh, of training, okay? And uh, when we work with partners using third party software like MoveOn, Mobility Online, etc., they cannot import our international agreement in their system. Uh, they receive a message telling that, and I put it in the, the QR uh, questions, that the partner has not shared an ID for this IIA. Therefore, no actions are available at this point. Please notify your partner to respectively contact their provider. What we do, in fact, we ask our provider to, to, to see what, what's the problem, to find a solution, but they don't find any solution. So it seems that when there is an organizational unit selected, okay, in addition to our institution, HEH, -E it doesn't work. N neither move on. Oh, no. Yes. Sorry for interrupting you. I've, I've answered this question a couple of times in the chat. It okay. doesn't have to do with the organizational units. Ah. The organizational units don't, do, do not interfere on the first exchange. Okay. This has to do with the partner not notifying about their, about their local ID. And therefore, we can't bind the instances of the IIA so that the negotiation of the IIA can proceed. But this is re really, really specific. <laughs> okay. Please, please take a look in the answer I've given you in the chat and okay. feel, free, feel free to reach out to the service desk yeah. if you would like for us to check the specifics of the problems you are having, check what, what is the partner that you are trying to exchange and maybe okay. try to untangle this for you, okay? Okay, okay, thank you very much. Okay, I will have yeah. it. Okay. I think, Laurent, I think it's good to ask this question, but like as, as Kostos responded, we have the service desk specifically for these types of more uh, personal or one case uh, problems. Okay. Um, so everybody who, who is in the Q&A who has asked such a question or who is still dealing with some question like that now, um, okay. The, the, the link to the ASCII service desk is available on the Competence Center, but I will also make it available in the, the, the feedback report. Um, okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. No, no problem. Um, and I think um, we have to round up this first town hall. Um, I want, want to thank you everyone for being here um, because we, like I said, we, weren't, we didn't really know what to expect, but the idea of this, this format is like it actually like how it went today. Um, we will be here. Uh, I think for the as part of the action plan, we have one more town hall meeting scheduled in the fall, um, and uh, it will be the same. We will be here. You can ask your questions, um, and we will do our best to answer them. So um, I want to thank everyone for being here during the holidays. Uh, it's, it wasn't the easiest day to find, uh, but you showed up, um, and I, I want to thank you for that. Um, and like I said. If you have future questions, um, there are different places where we can interact and engage with you. The main one being the Slack uh, and the service desk uh, and all the information on how to join or where to find them will be made available again. Um, so thank you today. Also, thank you to everyone from Consortium who was here today. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I wish you all a very pleasant day uh, and good luck with the start of the academic year, uh, I assume. Um, so thank you, everyone.